the uh, economic thought in the very late empire, the last 10 years or so of the empire's existence. Um, and in doing that, I'm hoping that I can address or at least put on the table a much broader question, uh, which may seem somewhat trite uh, as I pose it. But that question is why liberal policies, and by the of course, classical liberal economic policies, why they are banned? Why do states or policies abandon classical liberal economic policies? Um, and one of the response to that, of course, one answer to that is that uh, these are abandoned in response to changing circumstances, changing economic realities, uh, or um, uh, other kinds of uh, economic needs. Uh, that the society uh, faces. Another uh, answer to the question is that uh, states or societies abandon classical liberal economic policies in the pursuit of some other goals, some other social or political, in any case, non economic goals or strategies. And so um, I wanted us to put that on the table to keep that in mind, perhaps, as um, I tell you this very to me, anyway, very interesting little story uh, for the next uh, uh, next few minutes um, about uh, the, the late Ottoman Empire. Because, as a matter of fact, um, uh, this question occurs in the uh, economic history of the late Ottoman Empire, admittedly not a huge, not a huge uh, uh, field of study, but interesting one, nevertheless. Because in the 19th century, in the 19th century, Ottoman economic thought and official Ottoman state economic policy. Uh, was predicated on classical liberalism, on free trade, uh, property rights, on low tariffs, these kinds of things. Uh, by the early 20th century, or in the early 20th century, uh, these policies were banned. So uh, I'm asking why that, why that was. So this is the I want to look at uh, in my brief remarks this afternoon. In the secondary literature, uh, the way that this question is answered is usually um, that these classical liberal policies. Uh, or the abandonment of these classical liberal policies uh, was a, a good thing, actually. Uh, it showed a kind of economic maturity on the part of the, uh, of the rulers of the empire, and they got rid of all those woolly headed ideas about free trade and uh, low tax and property rights and this kind of thing. Uh, that this was somehow or other uh, an almost a natural step in the evolution of the Ottoman state, the abandonment of. Uh, of, uh, of liberal economic policies in exchange for, uh, for, uh, for status ones. But as you can probably guess by now, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a different story as to why these, uh, why these policies were uh, in fact abandoned by 1914. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, uh, the 19th century, the Ottoman state uh, had uh, pursued a largely, uh, a largely uh, liberal economic, uh, economic program. And this continued after 1908, uh, so something that's known in historians to be known for the revolution. And Mustafa alluded to this very, very uh, briefly, I think. Uh, this was a revolution uh, that, was, uh, that was spearheaded by the Ustin, uh, Ustin coalition of uh, individuals and groups collectively called by Europeans, not by themselves, by Europeans, called the Young Turks. And the dominant party of this coalition was called the Committee of Union and Progress. And as you might be able to tell by their name, they're motivated primarily by positivism, by Colombian positivism. They just separated, they just substituted the order, the order of progress, and put uh, union uh, in progress. But their main interest, their main theological background was, uh, was positivism. So this meant that they had a very sort of progressive, modernizing uh, sort of agenda uh, for themselves uh, and for the empire. But initially, at least, um, they uh, were fully committed uh, to uh, modernizing the, the empire uh, within a liberal uh, or it's a liberal economic context. And their first uh, minister of finance, I mean, the, the new government, was uh, named Mehmet Javid Bey. He'd been a member of their inner circle, uh, as it were. He was a long time member of the committee. Um, and he was uh, himself a strong uh, supporter of. Um, uh, of uh, liberal economic policies. So that meant that he wanted to strengthen property rights, and the civil kind of tax code, and so forth. And he took a number of steps in this, uh, in this direction. Um, he uh, introduced a simplified method of tax collection, which raised government revenue by 25% in 
admittedly, maybe not maybe even one year to have one piece to that. He um, also um, uh, supervised the passage of the land law in 1911 and a new inheritance law in 1913, both of which uh, simplified and streamlined um, uh, rules and regulations regarding property rights um, in land and in, uh, in uh, uh, movable wealth. Uh, he also was a very strong opponent of free trade uh, and both opponent of protectionism. Um, he believed that protectionism would destroy any long-term hopes for the empire's prosperity. In one of his many essays, uh, for example, one of his many essays, he wrote that protectionism is the greatest enemy of the worker. Uh, behind protected tariffs continued two or three uh, capitalists, yes, his owners of capital, uh, would become rich, while thousands of our countrymen would be impoverished. So instead of trying to build a, a state-supported industry behind protectionist barriers, he stressed the importance of agriculture and commerce. Another one of his uh, essays he wrote, perhaps uh, overstating his point, we are today, we will be tomorrow, an agricultural country. So he believed that the best hopes for uh, the economic development of the empire uh, lay in uh, exploiting the empire's comparative advantage in, uh, in agriculture. He also argued that such domestic and foreign capital as there was would be best directed, uh, if possible, towards the development of more productive exploitation of the empire's agricultural resources um, through such things as railways, port improvements, wagon roads, um, so on and so forth. And he hoped that these policies would increase uh, foreign investment, which he actively eagerly courted. Uh, as a way of developing uh, developing the empire, but I think this plan ran into a number of uh, a number of difficulties. The um, uh, liberals, uh, among them, uh, whom I count uh, John Bay, uh, faced two uh, important but related challenges to their ideas. And for the purposes of this paper, I'm calling them socialists and solidarists. Um, the socialists were not very numerous in the empire. They did have some members in the Ottoman parliament. And one of the most outspoken members of the parliament was a, a deputy from Istanbul named Krikor Zohrat uh, And there was a very interesting exchange in the uh, minutes of the Ottoman parliament between Jaffa Bey and Zohrat Fendi over the issue of protectionism. Um, and basically, to uh, make, uh, to sort of just give you this in a, a nutshell, um, John Bay's argument was that uh, protectionist terrorists would essentially ruin any prospects for the economic development of the empire by shutting out uh, the possibility of foreign capital investment. Whereas uh, Zohar Fendi uh, argued that foreign investment was really just um, uh, an example of the depredation of European finance capital, that it really was would, uh, basically enslave the empire. Now, one thing that is very interesting twist on all of this is that these uh, is that the writings by a lot of the socialists didn't have a tremendously wide circulation, weren't really very popular um, until, interesting enough, an import, an import by the name of Alexander Helcom, who was a Russian socialist, a Marxist Leninist, um, uh, moved to the empire in 1912, a kind of self-imposed exile. And Helcom, um, writing under the pen name Harbus Effendi, um, uh, actually popularized states economic ideas in the empire. He argued in a classical Marxist Leninist style that the Ottoman Empire was being reduced to the status of, of a colony uh, through the investments of European bankers and capitalists, that these uh, predatory capitalists were, for instance, enslaving uh, the empire. And the only way out of this situation, argued Marcus Fendi, was for the state to take a strong role in managing the economy and especially fostering industry uh, through protected tariffs. Now, his goal in all of this was, of course, I guess dialectical, right? What he wanted to see was the development of an Ottoman bourgeoisie, the new bourgeoisie before the eventual socialist revolution. Um, so he said the only way we're going to get a bourgeois class in the Ottoman Empire is through these, um, uh, with the help of the state. Now, what's very interesting to me is that Carlos Fendi published these writings, he published these essays, um, not in the Ottoman uh, socialist press, but he published them in a journal called uh, Turkish Home. Now, this magazine, Turkish Home, 
wasn't filled with decorated gifts or dressed keys or it wasn't that kind of a church home magazine. Uh, it was actually a magazine uh, published by a group of Turkish nationalists. And this is one of the movements to which I'm stopping by referring to this remarks this morning. This is one of the intellectual currents circulating during the uh, last few years of the Ottoman, uh, the Ottoman Empire. And uh, the Turkish nationalists were interested in uh, Parvo's and Benny's ideas, not because they were socialists, but because his ideas fit very well with their own agenda. And their own agenda, of course, is to transform the Ottoman Empire into a Turkish state. Um, and uh, in particular, they were interested in the, the ideological tool uh, uh, which they were uh, which they were engaged in this effort. Um, it's sometimes translated solidarism, which is uh, And this is very uh, similar. This idea um, is very similar to some of the ideas that were circulating all over Europe and North America at about the same time. It purported to have to espouse a kind of third way between capitalism and socialism, uh, one that in place of the class conflict um, uh, of socialism or allegedly in capitalism, it substituted cooperation between uh, classes um, and a state-directed effort to reorganize society and the economy into corporate bodies. And this, these ideas were circulating, as I said, all over, uh, all over Western, uh, Western Europe and North America at this, um, at this same time. Uh, by organizing society this way, um, uh, society could just be modernized, um, the economy could be strengthened, and class conflict could be avoided all in one, uh, all in one, in one go. Part of this program, they drew very heavily on the rights of uh, Friedrich List, the German economist, also argued for uh, support of development industry by means of high and slight Right. So by 1913 or so, uh, therefore, uh, the liberal and state economic programs have been pretty well staked out on both sides. Um, and the liberal ended up losing. So, why is that? Well, um, I think uh, that the reason that uh, the liberal ideas were uh, fighting the band, because the solidarist ideas, the economic ideas accompanying solidarism, fit very neatly with the development of Turkish nationalist ideas on the part of the members of the Canadian Union of Progress. Not only that, in January 1913, some of the members of the Community of Union Progress staged the coup d'etat by which they essentially seized control of the Ottoman government. So by, by the spring of 1913, the mem many of the members, not all, but many of the members of the Community of Union Progress were interested in developing a Turkish nation, in building a Turkish national identity, a Turkish nation uh, that would dominate the empire, and they seized upon the ideas of solidarism as an, as an ideological tool to put that program uh, into effect. So all they needed then was the opportunity to do so, which happened long in the summer of 1914. And some historians argue that one of the reasons that the Ottoman state became involved in World War I in 1914 was precisely to provide a national crisis price situation in the empire, during which they could implement some of these, uh, some of their anti-liberal programs. Indeed, they got right to work. As soon as they joined uh, the war, um, they passed a, a law for encouragement of industry, which set up state uh, state control, state direction over industrial development. Something they established something called the Society of Guilds, which sought to reorganize all economic activity in the empire according to state uh, directed uh, corporations, and something called the Committee of National Defense that again uh, sought to um, uh, bring all economic activity. Under the control of the, um, of the state, um, these different committees and corporations, of course, were all staffed with CUP cadres, the people who were loyal to the CUP. And the CUP's plan was to use these cadres then as the nucleus of the Turkish national bourgeoisie that would then in turn dominate uh, the uh, state. Well, as a matter of fact, they actually did have some success during the war in both cases. There was some industrialization. And some of these cadres, and these different SUP sponsored organizations, did become very wealthy. They became known as the rich of 1916 uh, for all of the money they made, uh, nominating the, uh, these different, uh, different state sponsored uh, organizations. But the real price, of course, for all of this was paid by people who were not connected to uh, the CUP networks. And large.
large fleet. These were the small farmers and sharecroppers of Anatolia uh, and the workers uh, in the urban uh, centers of the empire. During the war, uh, the rural economy uh, was, uh, was largely uh, wrecked, and prices in cities during the course of the war rose by 400%. So to wrap this story up then, the sea piece, Salaris, uh, status policies, uh, led the empire into war and ruined the economy. And as Mehmet Javid had predicted, uh, these kinds of policies indeed enriched a few people, in this case, the CBP's agents, while impoverished the entire. Thank you.